Hello everybody, my name is Lise van der Kele and today I will present on a chemical disinfection validation for reusable devices, a road trip to the European and US market. Now this topic is clearly about reusable medical devices. These are devices which are, which are used in the healthcare facility, as you can see on this picture, the scissors used by the surgeon during an operation, but also the monitor in the back where you can follow the heartbeat. These are devices which are used in the healthcare facility and then processed, which means they are cleaned, disinfected and, and or steam sterilized and then are reused in that healthcare facility again. So these are devices are used over and over again. Now, the topic of today focuses only on one part of this processing step, the disinfection. I think we all know how to disinfect our hands at the moment, but how do you disinfect your device and to, in order to reuse that? And why is the disinfection of a reusable medical device so important? It is important because you want to make sure that if the device is contaminated with microorganisms, that for the next use, for the next patient, there are no microorganisms present anymore, or the risk for the next patient is actually significantly reduced, or also to protect the healthcare workers from a potential uh, infection by cross-contamination. So it's very important to make sure that microorganisms on your device are killed. Now, if you disinfect your medical device, how do you know if it's disinfectant? How do you see that? Uh, you follow a procedure, can you vis visually check that? No, you actually are dealing with what I would call a black box. So you're going to disinfect, when you disinfect your hands, you follow the procedure, you use your alcohol gel, but you actually don't know if viruses or bacteria are killed. You just have to rely on the disinfectant and the procedure you have followed. This means that in the healthcare facility, when these devices are used and later on disinfected, that you have to trust on this black box, that you have to trust and rely on the procedure. And it is actually like as such that it comes back into use. So the validation of this disinfection procedure is essential to demonstrate the effect effectiveness of this disinfection. That is crucial because in the healthcare facility, there is no check anymore. You follow that procedure and you must rely on that. So today I wanna to guide you towards good disinfection validation to design good disinfection validation for reusable devices. Now to make it a little bit more fun because we're all watching this uh, from our houses or offices virtually, let's assume that the road towards a good disinfection validation is actually like a travel journey. And we're going to travel this road trip in order to get a stamp in our passport to enter the US or the European market with an appropriate disinfection procedure which has been validated. And I will be more than happy to be your guide today towards a good design of such a disinfection validation and uh, I will give you some tips and tricks. To even actually make it more fun because our laboratory here is uh, located in Belgium and I'm also from Belgium Let's assume it's a disinfection validation road trip in Belgium. So as a good guide, I will give you some suggestions, call them travel choice awards, like visit the Atomium in, in Brussels, or avoid or warn you for potential tourist trap. I will use in the slides, for instance, a picture of this uh, statue, the boy peeing called Manneke Pis. It looks really nice. It's like the most famous statue in Belgium. But if you watch it, in reality, it's very, very small. So you might be very disappointed when you see it. So it's a potential tourist trap, which you want to avoid. But it's also worth to see, of course. But in the slides, if you see the statue of the boy peeing, look out, pay extra attention. Do you see the atomium? These are really tips you should consider in your design. So I hope everybody's ready to start their journey. Perhaps close your eyes, think about a nice location in Belgium which you want to visit, and let's go ahead. Now, before we start, of course, we want to design a good disinfection validation, but you need a disinfection procedure. If you don't have any procedure to validate, then we cannot start our journey. So you must have a procedure, and that must be part of your instruction for use, and as all information in your instruction for use. It should be logical, it should be readable, it should be short, clear for the end user. Use images, use specific instruction, and that's very important to start with that procedure. 
you don't have any procedure, you can of course rely on experts to design that together with you, but it is the procedure which you're going to validate. So let's assume we have a procedure and we're on the road trip. Now, when you start a road trip for your disinfection validation, you can choose three doors to enter, a black, a yellow, or a red door on this slide. Each door has a specific level of disinfection and has some criteria, and I will guide you towards each of these doors. And let's enter the black door. The black door represents the level, the low level disinfection. So it's a lethal process, it's a disinfection process that allows you to kill all forms of vegetative bacteria, some fungi, some viruses. So it kills a lot of microorganisms as bacteria and fungi. You can use this level of disinfection when you're dealing with non-critical devices. Non-critical devices, according to the Spalding classifications, are devices that do, do not directly come in contact with the patient, so they only touch intact skin or not directly in contact with the patient. So you could use that door, that level of disinfection if you're dealing with non-critical devices. You can also enter the, or choose for your disinfection procedure to enter the yellow door. That is a lethal process, a higher level than low level disinfection that kills, of course, the vegetative bacteria and some fungi, but also mycobacteria, but no bacterial spores. Okay, what type of devices uh, do I want to have or what type of devices are more um, subjected to an intermediate level disinfection? These are also non-critical devices. So this is a little bit a tricky part. So if you ha are dealing with a non-critical device, a device that only contacts skin or indirectly the patient, you can either, either choose a low-level disinfection or an intermediate-level disinfection. Can I just randomly choose? The answer is yes and no. There is no clear guidance on when to choose low-level or intermediate-level disinfection. But as a rule of thumb, if your device comes frequently in contact with the patient or it's used multiple times or there is a higher risk of cross-contamination, then you should choose more for intermediate level disinfection. Or if your device is soiled with blood, which can contain pathogens, which can of course increase the risk, then also you would lean more towards intermediate level disinfection. If you're uncertain, I would really advise you to ask your healthcare authorities or your notified body to see, okay, what, what is the most appropriate level uh, for my non-critical device? If there is non-patient contact and it's not a, a critical soil, then low level is sufficient. Otherwise, perhaps more intermediate level disinfection. So that's already tricky. Thank God if you enter the, the red door, which stands for a high level disinfection, then you're going to have a disinfection level that actually is capable or a process that's capable to kill all forms of microbial life except for large numbers of bacterial spores. So it's the highest level of disinfection. It kills the most microorganism. This is really uh, necessary when you're dealing with semi-critical devices. These are devices that come in contact with non-intact skin or intact mucous membranes. And you could also use it for critical devices, devices that enter the sterile tissue or the vascular system. But you really have to justify in that case why sterilization is not possible. So only if sterilization is not possible, high level disinfection is allowed but you really have to have a good justification. So the preference is always for critical and even for semi-critical devices. If you can sterilize the device, then you should go for a sterilization validation and not for a high level disinfection. But uh, that is just important for you to know, but sometimes your material is just not compatible with sterilization and you can only rely on high level disinfection. So, we know the three doors, the three colors. We have three levels of disinfection, which we can achieve depending on the procedure. So it's important when you start your validation that you know through which door you want to enter, the black, the yellow, or the red in this case. Now, luckily, each type of validation, whether you enter the black door, the yellow door, or the red door, the setup of your disinfection validation can be split into four parts. I've highlighted them here on the slide, and I will now go in depth in each type of these four parts. 
and it, these are all the same for the three doors. So you have a main validation framework, which you can use even when you enter the black, the yellow, or the red sort. It makes it easier for everybody. So first of all, step one is look at your device. Now we're here on the road trip and the people that are traveling with eight bags in their hand and some on their back, they're not enjoying their journey because it's heavy, it's loaded. So ideally travel light. How can you travel light? If you're having a lot of devices which need to go, which needs to be disinfected, theoretically you should validate your disinfection procedure for each of these devices. What I would recommend is can you do family grouping? Are these devices more or less similar? Do they have the same surface? Do they, are they in a similar way in contact with the patients? What are their difficult areas to disinfect? You can group your devices and then validate your procedure on one representative of that device. So that's, let's say, one of my uh, travel awards. It has a big advantage because it will reduce the timing. Okay, it will take some time to create or to decide how are we going to group our devices. But in the long run, you have fewer validations, so it will reduce timing. And secondly, it will reduce also your budget. The cost of a validation can be significantly reduced. What you need, on the other hand, is you need input on this infection. You need expert input, and you have to make sure that you choose the worst case devices based on your expertise on or your knowledge knowledge on disinfection. Now that's very important that you take into account. But you can travel light and please travel light. What else do you need to know about your device? When you are disinfecting, can you disassemble your device? That is sometimes makes it easier to reach difficult areas to disinfect. How, what are the surface like? Are there specific holes or is the texture actually more difficult to disinfect? And which areas uh, are touched the most, like the on and off button or the, the plug? Are there potential risk at those uh, parts of your device? So know your device, know how they can be disinfected and where are the areas which are difficult to reach, where microorganisms may be present, but it's very difficult to reach them to disinfect them, or uh, how, where are they touched the most? Now, a question that we also are asked a lot. So what type of devices do you use for your validation? Because the advantage is you have these reusable devices. So do you perform the validation on devices which are already used? Or do you use your valid or you do you perform your validations on new devices? Actually, it's very easy, both are okay. So for a cleaning validation, there you need to use used devices. Whereas for disinfection validation, you can perform your validation on new devices or on used devices. You shouldn't bring them in a simulated use situation. That's perfectly fine. That makes it a little bit easier. So both are, of them are perfectly fine. So we have covered the first part of our four steps. Step one, we know our device. We have learned about family grouping. Then the next thing, what we do, and then we are actually in the lab, we're going to contaminate our device. What does it mean? We're going to take microorganisms and actually bring them onto the device. Like you see in the picture, you have your device, you bring droplets of microorganisms on that device. Now, here are some tips. Use a low volume of droplets with a high concentration of microorganisms instead of a large volume. It, it's just not very practical. Also, do not inoculate the whole device. You should not have bacteria or microorganisms inoculated everywhere. Just focus on the difficult areas. Define those areas in your validation protocol to make sure that in the lab, people know where to actually put the microorganisms. But they shouldn't be just everywhere. Just focus on those points. Now, what type of microorganisms uh, do we put on the device? Now, I'm back here with my three doors. You have, again, you see it, the black, the yellow, and the red. Depending on the level of disinfection you have chosen, you will have to add different types of microorganisms. So for low-level disinfection, you're going to challenge your procedure for poor vegetative bacteria, E. coli, P. 
Klebsiella pneumona, Staphylococcus aureus, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So these are the four main microorganisms or bacteria that are used to challenge your procedure and to obtain a low-level disinfection. When you want to challenge your device and want to validate for an intermediate level disinfection, you have to use those same four vegetative bacteria again, and you have to add one mycobacterium species. And for high level disinfection, you should only challenge your method using one mycobacterium species. I will come more into detail later on, but you see already a little bit of a difference, but how you inoculate and how you do that, that's the same for all types of levels. Uh, and the only difference is that for intermediate level disinfection, you should challenge the device with five different organisms, whereas for high level disinfection, only with one microorganism. Now, why are we using different types of microorganisms? When you look at this uh, pyramid or triangle, you see on the bottom the le least resistant microorganisms in nature and on the top the most resistant. You see that the vegetative bacteria are not very resistant compared to mycobacteria. So mycobacteria are one of the most resistant microorganisms and that's why they are also chosen for high level disinfection whereas the vegetative bacteria are chosen for low-level disinfection because the definition of a low-level disinfection, you should be able, with your disinfection procedure, to kill vegetative bacteria, perhaps some fungi and some viruses. So that is perfectly fine to use those organisms, whereas for a high-level disinfection, you should kill almost all uh, microbial life, so mycobacterium, if you're capable of killing those, Every microorganism listed here below mycobacterium is definitely killed, and it will also include uh, some killing of a few bacterial spores, but not huge amounts. So that explains why these are chosen. Now, why mycobacterium? As I said, they're very resistant because they have a thicker, unique cell wall, and they are more resistant to detergent, disinfectant, and they're very slow growing. So they're very ideal to challenge your method. Now, can I choose? any mycobacterium species. Now, in most of the guidelines, it's just written, use an appropriate mycobacterium species. I've listed here six different mycobacterium species. You have mycobacterium tuberculosis, you have mycobacterium terri, and so on. Can I choose all of them? Look out, I've put a statue of the little boy. You cannot choose all of them. For instance, mycobacterium tuberculosis is a a severe pathogen, you don't want to use that in your lab. It is just a dangerous a pathogen is, is not likely to perform a validation with, so I would not recommend it. So it's like choosing chocolate, uh, if I'm going back to my Belgium trip. So eating chocolate, I like chocolate, and not every chocolate tastes the same. So you want to make sure that you have chosen the right chocolate for your ultimate Belgium chocolate experience, and there are many differences in types and taste. And that's the same with the mycobacterium. You choose the mycobacterium species that is relevant for your validation. And for a chemical disinfection validation, I would recommend mycobacterium terri or bovis because they're described in some uh, guidelines. But if you want to use another species, make sure that you have a good justification why you have chosen, for instance, mycobacterium avium, and you need to have data to prove that it is a resistant mycobacterium species. On the other hand, Mycobacterium smegmatis is not a good choice because it is not such a resistant organism compared to the other Mycobacterium. So think about a box of chocolate, just don't pick randomly any chocolate, ask for advice, look into guidelines and pick the right one because you will have a better chocolate experience or a better disinfection validation. So we know how to contaminate our device. We know our device, we know how to contaminate our device, now let's use our disinfection procedure. Let's validate the method. You start, of course, by selecting a disinfectant, a, an agent, a chemical agent with a chemical property that will kill the bacteria. You will select one of them. There are multiple. You have to make sure that the disinfectant is compatible with your device, that it does not degrade in contact, uh, that your device doesn't degrade in contact with your disinfectant. You also have to look at the availability of the disinfectant on the market where you want to place your product on. So if you want to uh, sell your product in the United States and it's a product or disinfectant that's only sold in Europe, then it's actually not a good choice. 
and there are also some different in requirements for the European market compared to the US market. So make sure that not only based on availability, but also on sort of preference and what they expect. So look out for that and think about those things. Some suggestions for high level disinfectants, uh, you can use glutaraldehyde solution or hydrogen peroxide based disinfectant. But what's most important is for the, definitely for the US market is that you use a high level, level disinfectant from the, which is cleared or allowed by the FDA. So I've put a link here on this slide. Just this gives you a list. If you click on this link, a list of all the disinfectants that are good or approved by the FDA for high level disinfection. Any other one is very unlikely that it will be uh, accepted for a high level disinfection validation. And another thing that is important in Europe, they have more the preference to use hydro hydrogen peroxide or periacetic acid solutions for their uh, high level disinfection. Whereas in the US, they have a preference for glutaraldehyde solutions. So it is possible that if you want to access both markets, that you need to perform multiple validations. So for each type of disinfectant, you have to perform a disinfection validation. So take that into account think about the markets and think about uh, the selection of the disinfectants. Some tips about, I said, these are the do's for high level disinfection, a don't. For instance, alcohol is in general uh, a disinfectant which is used a lot, mainly uh, for, for instance, disinfection of your hands. But do you, if you want to claim a high level disinfection when you're using alcohol, that's not appropriate. It is not listed as a high level disinfectant. It will not meet the acceptance criteria later on, but don't do that. Don't even choose a disinfectant which is not registered as a high level disinfectant. If you want to use alcohol and you are on your road trip in Belgium, I would recommend to drink one of our Belgian beers with a nice uh, Belgian fries with mayonnaise and you have a nice experience of the alcohol, but don't claim it for the high level disinfection. If you want to perform a low or an intermediate level disinfection, then isopropyl, isopropyl alcohol is perfectly fine. You have also chlorine, bleach, and so on. Uh, for both the black and the yellow door, you can use the same types of uh, disinfectant. What's important for the US market is that you use an EPA listed disinfectant. So you can go to the website of EPA, which is also here on the slide, but FDA is asking for their uh, the, the EPA number of your disinfectant. You should have include that in your validation report. So again, something to remember and to include when selecting your disinfectant. So we have chosen our disinfectant. It's already uh, a lot of choosing. We have to choose which door to enter, which disinfectant. But then the disinfection method, how are you going to do that? If I look again at my red door, that's the easiest. For high level disinfection, you need to soak or submerge your device completely in the disinfectant in a solution. Otherwise, it will be very hard to have a high level disinfection to, to reach that level of disinfection. Whereas for low level and intermediate level, you can do spraying, wiping. You can also soak and submerge That's of course, also possible. But that is important that you make the distinction if you enter the red door, then you must be able to completely submerge your device in the disinfectant. And as you know, that is not possible for all devices, so there are some restrictions. Then when it comes to the validation, you know your method, it's spraying, wiping, submerging. In the validation, we are going to challenge the procedure by selecting the worst case condition. So when it comes to spraying, we are going to reduce the, the numbers of spray. If your procedure says disinfect by three sprays, we will use perhaps two sprays. Wiping, you can reduce the number of wipes. When you submerge your device into, into a disinfectant, you use the lowest concentration if a concentration range of the disinfectant is described. You will always shorter the contact time of the disinfectant with your device, you will reduce some rinsing steps and so on. So you will challenge and select worst case conditions, but not too worst case. You don't want to over challenge the method. You still have to be the method which you're going to validate is a worst case, but it still has to be able to kill off the microorganisms. 
tips and tricks, what are challenges in the lab if you are doing these types of validation in the lab. If you're talking about spraying or wiping, it is very subjective uh, because the person who is performing that procedure uh, can have some difficulties to, to obtain consistency between replicates and you have to define a clear method of wiping, like twisting the wipe or, or, or defining clear areas where to pay extra attention to when you submerge your device, um, avoid air bubbles, if there are holes or pores you need to flush, include that in your protocol because that's that are things that are often forgotten and can actually result in a failure afterwards. So we'll come to that later, but that are things uh, which I would say tips and tricks for the lab. Part four, evaluation. So we know our device. We have chosen which door we want to enter. We are going to contaminate the device with microorganism. We have disinfected. We have challenged our procedure. How can we evaluate whether or not it is a good disinfection procedure? Because we know in the healthcare facility, remember the black box, the people in the hospital need to make sure that the procedure that they're following is actually going to kill the microorganisms. In this disinfection validation, you have three important steps which you need to evaluate. First of all, uh, as you can see, I talk about here about neutralization testing. This is actually a test which is necessary to perform in the lab. It's evaluation of the residual disinfectants to make sure that they are not um, uh, inhibiting growth of microorganisms. You want to avoid false negatives. So it is a control you add in the lab to make sure that if you are going to perform the extractions later on and you're going to perform your lab testing, you want to avoid that residuals of the detergents might create a false negative and you say, okay, a lot of bacteria are killed, but they're actually killed because of the way you're testing about because of your setup. So that is an important control. You always need to include and notified bodies and, and healthcare uh, uh, agencies like the FDA are asking for neutralization testing and where the data are to make sure that you don't have false negatives. But the actual evaluation of your procedure is in the bio load reduction. What are we going to do? We have our devices. So they have been inoculated, we have disinfected them, and we have these devices, but we also have a positive device control. In every validation, in everything that you do in the lab work in general, you have to have controls. Now for a disinfection validation, you need a positive control. As you can see here, the positive control is your device, which has been contaminated or inoculated with a microorganism, but hasn't been disinfected, so it's unprocessed. So it's a device which contains a lot of microorganisms. Your test article, that's always three replicates, which are challenged or inoculated with your microorganism, and then are disinfected. So these are the actual test articles that are going to challenge your method, but you need to have that positive control to make sure that you have actually put microorganisms on it. But I will come back to that later, but it's very important to include a positive control, your test article, three replicates, and then of course the neutralization, which I already discussed. So you have your disinfected devices, you have your positive device control, and now what do you want to do after you have disinfected them? You want to extract the microorganisms from your device. You're going to do that through sonication, manual shaking, flushing, whatever. You want to make sure that whatever microorganisms is present on your device, because you have inoculated, for instance, E. coli on your device, you want to retrieve all the remaining E. coli of your device or the remaining mycobacterium as efficient as possible. That is what you're going to do. And then you're going to analyze this extract and actually count how many microorganisms are still present in my extraction solution. It's the bio burden uh, of your device and of your positive device control. And that is what you're going to evaluate. Now, what I have not discussed yet, so we have discussed the three levels of disinfection, the black, the yellow, and the red door, as, as we remember. But each level has, of course, a specific acceptance criteria. If you want to claim this procedure is uh, good to go for a low-level disinfection, then you know you have to challenge your method with four vegetative bacteria. 
And for each of them, you have to be able to demonstrate a six log reduction. What does it mean? It means that if, for instance, you inoculate 1 million E. coli, cloning forming units, so 1 million bacteria of a certain species are on your device, a six log reduction means that your disinfection procedure is capable of killing all of these organisms except for one. So the maximum number of microorganisms of that uh, vegetative bacteria that can remain on that device after your procedure is one if the original amount was 1 million. So it's a 99.9999% reduction. For the intermediate level disinfection, you want also have a six log reduction of the four bacteria and a three log reduction of the mycobacterium. Three log means a 99.9% .9 reduction. So from thousand to one. And the high level disinfection is of course a six log reduction from mycobacterium. So you see already the difference for a high level disinfection. You have to have a six log reduction of the most resistant uh, organism. So that's the most challenging. How do you calculate that? I will not go into that, but you are going to determine the, the log 10 of your positive device control and you subtract that with the counts on your test article and you will then determine the log reduction for each of your replicates. Therefore, it's very important that your positive device control contains, if you want to demonstrate a six log reduction, at the minimum, 1 million colony forming units, that's a, a microbiology term, but 1 million bacteria, for instance, 1 million mycobacterium, in order to be able to claim a six log reduction, because if your positive control only contains 1,000, you can only, and everything is killed, then you have reduced the amount from 1,000 to, to 1 or 0, so you only can claim a three log reduction. And for some of, of the, that is just not enough. So that means that you have to retest, but that's because the design, you did not spike enough. You can also not over-challenge by putting 10 or 100 million of these cloning forming units because that's just too high. So it's always finding the balance with do not over-challenge, but high enough to be able to actually have such a reduction. And when you're going to count or calculate the amount of, or, or trying to look how much is present on my positive device control, make the right dilution. If you don't dilute this extract, you will have no data which you can count and actually have unreliable data. So that's just another tip. But it's very important that your positive device control contains at least 10 to the 6 CFUs because otherwise you will not be able to claim a 6 log reduction. But what to, to do when the acceptance criteria are then not met? So first of all, check whether there has be no lab error if the positive con device control, as I explained, has not a high enough concentration to even claim a six log reduction, then just to retest that, that's just a lab error. But let's assume everything in the lab was fine and you did not meet your acceptance criteria. You can retest with a longer contact time, higher concentrations of, of a disinfectant, you can flush, you can wipe more. You can also add some more clarifications in your YFU to focus on the areas which are very hard to disinfect. If you remember in the beginning where I said know your device, this, this is why it's critical because there are areas which are difficult to reach. Then another thing uh, which is asked, for instance, I have a 5.8 log reduction. Is that not the same as six? If, if rounding up of figures, six, is mentioned in the guidelines, you have to obtain a six log reduction. So 5.8 is actually six log reduction. In practice, the acceptance criteria are actually 6.0 and 3.0. Although it's not written, that is the expectation. So you cannot round 5.8 off to six. That is uh, unfortunate perhaps, but that is uh, how it is. And it is also very important that you're aware of it. But do you always then have to retest and, and do that? Not always. You can first of all look at the average of your three replicates. Is the average above 6.0? That can be a justification perhaps to overrule the six log reduction for all three replicates. You can also then include a risk assessment. Here I refer also to an article uh, written by my colleagues Alpa Patel and Griffin Kamak where they say perhaps a six log reduction for some of these non-critical devices is 
too worst case, it's too extreme. But again, you should add after your validation then the right justification from a scientific point of view with the actual use of your device, how it's contaminated in the healthcare facility in actual li life and why you can actually claim that your reduction which you have achieved is more than sufficient for that application. But in general, the acceptance criteria are set six and three, depending on which level of reduction. And if you want to make a risk assessment, then you can do that, but it is not the most straightforward way to go, but it's possible specifically when you have 5.8, 5.9 log reduction, then perhaps it can be good once you go Four lock, only a four lock reduction or a three lock reduction. When you have to obtain a six lock reduction, there I would go for retesting. So it's uh, sometimes a tricky business. Most of the times, or in uh, most of the times, this is where the disinfection validation evaluation ends for all devices that are non patient contact. When you have a patient contact device, there is a third part of the validation which you should include, and that is cytotox testing. The cytotox testing here is actually used to evaluate whether residues of the disinfectants are still present on the device. We know that disinfectants might cause some, are, are not actually the nicest chemicals or agents, they kill bacteria, so they can actually also cause some skin irritation or sensitization. So therefore, we want to make sure are there still residues present on your device? And we're going to evaluate that through a cytotox test. That's always included in a disinfection validation when the device is in patient contact, okay? And how many devices are we going to test? For the cytotox test, it's uh, in the yellow box. We're going to use three samples, which are processed, which are disinfected with a high disinfection concentration. We're not going to inoculate these devices for cytotoxicity with bacteria because we're only interested in the residues of the disinfectant. But also please note that in this case, when we select worst case disinfection procedure, we're going to choose for high disinfectant concentration, longer contact time of your device with the disinfectant because we want to actually look for disinfectant residue, which may cause harm to the patient or to the user. Whereas in the rest of the validation, when we're challenging the method to kill microorganisms, we use the lowest disinfection concentration. So it's a little bit of different, um, different steps, so you cannot combine all of them together, but you have to make sure for each test, what is my end goal? Do I want to evaluate the effect of killing microorganisms, or do I want to evaluate residuals which might be harmful to the patient or the user of the device. That's why there is uh, a difference. What to do then when the cytotox fails, because that happens? You can first look to your procedure. You can increase the rinsing, include rinsing step. Perhaps you have chosen a two worst case situation there. Also, when you perform the cytotox test, Normally, you extract your device uh, for cytotoxicity 24 hours. Perhaps you can reduce the, the contact time because you're only looking at disinfectant uh, residues. Or you can also only extract or look at the parts of the device that actually come in contact with the patient. If you have a device which only partially comes in contact with the patient, you only should evaluate for residues on that part, and the rest is actually irrelevant, and you might have over-challenged or overestimated it. On the other hand, you can also look at the device. We have done some studies where we have a failure, but in the end, it appears that the device, even without residues or with the disinfection step, is already cytotoxic by nature, that it's just a material. So sometimes it's better than to include a control device to demonstrate that it's not linked to the disinfectant residue, but that it's actually to the device. So before you include this step in your validation, look at the biocompatibility data which is available because if it is a cytotoxic device or the materials are a cytotoxic, then it's not a good test to evaluate for detergent residues. And you might have to look for another test to look for traces of residues. So that is very important uh, to, to be aware of that. So I thought that this was the last step of the disinfection validation. One part before we come to the end of our road trip is, can the cytotox data 
that we have obtained now in this disinfection validation, can we also use that to evaluate the biocompatibility or the cytotoxicity of that device? Can we do that? There we need to know, make a distinction. In this design, we're only going to look for residue presence. So we're only going to look, is there disinfectant residue present on my device? Whereas in biocompatibility, of course, we want to know what the effect is of the disinfectant, but we want to know how is the material behaving after multiple cycles, also after cleaning. Uh, is that included here? To make it more clear, ISO 10993-1 says that you should evaluate the biological safety of the device over the whole life cycle of the device, which means for a reusable device, you have to include cleaning, disinfection, and or sterilization. And ISO 10993 also said that you have to also evaluate for the maximum number of, of cycles. Now, in a disinfection validation, we have only looked at one part of that life cycle. So we're only looking at the disinfection. So when we were performing these tests in the context of a disinfection validation, we have not necessarily cleaned the device prior to the this test. The device has not been sterilized if disinfection is not the endpoint. So we have not taken the final device, how it is uh, used in the healthcare setting, and then it's not always uh, relevant. And we only need to test for one cycle, so we have not included the effect of numerous cycles. What I would say, and what the take-home message for this would be, just don't assume that the data obtained in this disinfection validation can be automatically be used as, bi as a biocompatibility endpoint. Is it valuable da data? For sure. But look at how the data was obtained, what testing that you did, and then make the right assumption. And you can include that, of course, in your biocompatibility evaluation but don't assume that it is the end point. Perhaps you have to do some other testing as well. This brings me to the end of this road trip. So we have traveled a little bit in Belgium, but mostly towards the design of a good disinfection validation. We know that devices or reusable devices, they are used and we're focused on the disinfection step. Remember when I told you the black box, how do we know if a device is good, whether the disinfection procedure is good enough to kill enough microorganisms for the in order to, for the device to be safe for next use for the next patient? We have we can choose between three doors. I've put them here again on the slide. We have the black door, which is low level disinfection. We have the yellow door, intermediate level disinfection. The high level disinfection. We know what the acceptance criteria are. We know which bacteria you have to challenge or use to challenge your method. And we have defined the four steps of a validation. You have, so you know, need to know your device, you need to contaminate, inoculate, you need to disinfect your procedure and then evaluate it. You have received a lot of travelers awards, you have received a lot of tips and also some parts where you have to pay attention where there is a potential trap. But if you take this all into account, I'm sure at the end of your road trip, at the end of your journey, you will have a stamp in your passport and you will be able to access the European and or the US market if you have taken care and taken into account uh, both markets. It was my pleasure today to guide you. As a guide, uh, I can only emphasize the importance of a good validation. Also include the fact that if you perform this validation, make sure that you use the right quality systems. ISO 17025 accreditation of the laboratory is essential if you want to access the European market, whereas in the US you want to have a GLP, uh, the study performed under GLP. If you have any questions regarding disinfection validations, then you can, of course, reach out to me. And you have also learned during this journey how to choose the right chocolate, you have had some tips and tri tricks in Belgium, know when to drink a beer with nice Belgian fries. But what I did not mention, and it's an absolute uh, take home message, message as well. Also, if you go to Brussels, enjoy a nice Brussels waffle. Uh, as a tip, they have to be freshly baked, otherwise they're no good. They're not ideal, but they're very good and uh, very tasty.
If you're interested in more, there is already part one, a road trip on cleaning validations. So here you see the link. You can go to our website and find that road trip if you want to travel again. And if you have not enough, if that's not enough, then I can only say that part three, the next part on of our road trip series, which is on thermal disinfection and steam sterilization validation, will be released in 2021. So look on our website or through LinkedIn and you will definitely uh, see that. And you can always, of course, go to our website for more uh, events, for more uh, webinars, and also our sister companies, Nordion and Sterigenics. Sterigenics, who gives a lot of sterilization solutions on ethylene oxide or gamma irradiation, you can visit their website as well. So thank you for traveling with me, and I'm looking forward to be your guide on my third trip soon. Bye.